friends. Welcome to This Day in Jack Benny. I'm John Henderson. Today's episode is from December 7th, 1941. A date which will live in infamy. Here in the studio with me is Major George Fielding Elliott, Columbia's military expert, who will analyze now these latest developments in the Far East. Major Elliott. The Japanese appear to be taking the offensive in an effort to delay and impede American operations in the Far East. Apparently confronted with a situation in which there was no escape except war, the Japanese have attacked the main American naval base in the Pacific at Pearl Harbor on the island of Oahu in the Hawaiian Islands. We have been on the telephone with our station in uh, KGMB, which is in Honolulu, and they report to us that the attacking planes number between 50 and 100, that the air raid is still on, and that the anti-aircraft fire can be heard in a steady drone as the attacking planes come in. But in those days, they had a motto, the show must go on. And so the Jack Benny Show went ahead as planned with only a couple interruptions for updates. Last week on the Jack Benny Show... And furthermore... Hiya, Jackson. Well, me and the boys were playing down in San Diego last night. And on our way back this morning, we played Laguna Beach, Seal Beach, and San Pedro. How'd you do in Seal Beach, Phil? Oh, terrific. We got 20 dimes, 8 quarters, and 15 halibut. (laughs) Halibut? Say, that's my favorite fish. Speak to the piano player. 22 cents a pound. (laughs) Oh, you've got the fish and the piano, eh? And now, folks, as I started to announce... This evening, we are going to present Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There. Please, please don't take that stuff again. Oh, Dr. Jekyll! Mr. Hyde to you. That was Jack Benny's version of the Spencer Tracy movie, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which was in theaters at the time. I don't confuse you, do I, Ivy? (laughs) I believe I do confuse you a little, don't I? Oh, I ain't confused by nobody. Let go, do you hear? I'm going to put an end to all that confusion. Also in theaters, a movie that has since been called the greatest film of all time, Citizen Kane, produced, directed, and starring Orson Welles. This is Orson Welles. I don't know what you'll think about Mr. Kane. I can't imagine... You see, I play the part myself. In this episode, they mention Brenda and Cobina. Say, Brenda, what is it, Cobina? Now, really, don't you think I have an hourglass figure? Yeah, but it's about 45 minutes late. <laughs> Listen, Brenda, I didn't like that crack. You've been acting awful snooty since the Gophers voted you Miss Buck Teeth of 1941. That was the comedic version of Brenda and Cobina from the Bob Hope Show. The real Brenda and Cobina were wealthy young socialite Brenda Fraser and her best friend Cobina Wright Jr. I'm so tired of going out with all these well-groomed, good-looking society men. They also mention Esquire, the men's magazine, playwright Noel Coward, comedic actor Georgie Jessel, and band leader Glenn Miller. If you'd like to contact me, you can email jackbennypodcast at gmail.com, on Twitter at thisdaybenny, or just go to thisdaybenny.com and take a moment on your podcast player to give This Day in Jack Benny five stars and thank you. Listen for the latest historic news updates and enjoy the show. K-E-L-L-O. The Jello program brought to you by Jello and Jello Puddings. Starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with the Gay Ranchero. A convenient way to buy Jello, ladies and gentlemen, is to get several packages at a time and use them as you want them. And with the new Jell-O, you can do this without any fear that your supply of Jell-O will lose flavor and freshness as it stands on the pantry shelf. You can now buy a dozen packages of Jell-O at one time and know that they will all stay at the peak of their goodness until you want them. Because today, Jell-O's flavor is locked in. Locked into the Jell-O particles by an exclusive Jell-O process. 
the tiny jello particles deliver their full strength flavor to you intact. Now prove it for yourself. Open a package of jello. Notice that there's no telltale aroma, no sign of escaping fragrance and flavor. But the instant you dissolve the jello, you unlock its captive flavor, and out it pours in all its original richness. Tomorrow, when you order jello, order several packages. Get all of jello's six delicious flavors, and always have a full assortment on hand from which to choose. You can keep jello as long as you please. Its flavor doesn't go away. We put it in, and it's there to stay. The Gay Ranchero, played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my very great honor to bring you a man who last Sunday on this program gave you what was undoubtedly the finest performance of his acting career. That's right, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So without further ado, I give you the only actor in America who can make Jekyll and Hyde sound like Brenda and Cobina, <laughs> Jack Benny. <laughs> Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, that may be your idea of a funny introduction, but to ridicule my performance of last Sunday, which everyone hails as a dramatic nugget, <laughs> that really burns me up. Now, take it easy, Jack. I thought you played the part well enough, but I happened to see the picture, and I didn't think you were as good as Spencer Tracy. Oh, you didn't? No. Well, Don, let me ask you something. Uh, who signs your check every week? Spencer Tracy or the Benny Goose that lays the golden egg company? <laughs> Take that as my thought for today. But, Jack, you don't seem to understand. Oh, no. When Spencer Tracy played the part, there was a decided difference between both characters. But when you did it, I couldn't tell your Jekyll from your Hyde. <laughs> well, you can't tell your stomach from an igloo. <laughs> So what do you know about it? The fine pal you turned out to be. Not Jack. And don't call me Jack. From now on, you will please address me as Mr. Benny, and I'll call you Mr. Wilson. Is that clear? Oh, I think you're being very childish about the whole matter. Absolutely childish. Don't try to bring my age down. Flattery won't help. <laughs> Remember that, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson? Who's Mr. Wilson? That hulk over yonder. <laughs> Listen, Mary, you witnessed my performance last week. What did you think of it? Well, personally, I thought you were very good as Georgie Jessel. <laughs> I wasn't Jessel. I was Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll. Well, in that case, Pooey. <laughs> Pooey? What do you mean, Pooey? I don't get it. All right, take the word lovely and fool around with it. Let's see. Lovely. Lively. Low. Low. Mr. Benny to you. <laughs> and let me remind you and Mr. Wilson of something that you both may have forgotten. When I switched from Dr. Jekyll to that horrible Mr. Hyde and that gruesome look came over my face, women in the audience screamed. One of them even fainted. Well, it won't happen today. They caught that mouse. <laughs> All right. Oh, then I guess I can take these bicycle clips off my pants. <laughs> As long as you and Don are in such a critical mood, I'd like to point out that Christmas is only 18 days away. Why else did you come in mad at everybody? All right, keep it up, keep it up. You know, I already bought your Christmas present, young lady, but I may exchange it for something cheaper. Something cheaper? Yes. They don't dig a bargain basement that deep. <laughs> well, you worked in more of them than I did. <laughs> I can go along with a... Ouch! <laughs> you do that once more, Miss Livingston, and there'll be a... Oh, hello, Dennis. Hello, Mr. Benny. Gee, was that a performance you gave last week? Was that a performance? <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, thanks, Dennis. I'm glad you liked it. Not only me, my whole family thought you were wonderful. That's nice. I'm glad someone appreciated me. Listen, Jack, the trouble with you is the minute you do something halfway good, it goes right to your head. Mr. Benny was wonderful. Quiet. Why, to hear you talk, Jack, anyone would think you were the biggest ham in Hollywood. Oh. I'd like to see a bigger one, by golly. <laughs> Well, thanks, Dennis. You tried. <laughs> anyway, you thought I was good. Oh, marvelous. What a performance. <laughs> well, look, uh, look, kid. I'm making out my Christmas list today, so before singing your song, how about throwing out a few hints? Uh, what would you like Uncle Jack to get you? Well, I thought of a few things, but they're pretty expensive. Just name them. You're one person in this cast that deserves the best. Wait till I get my pencil here. Now, what do you want, Dennis? Well, I'd like to have a nice gray suit with a pinstripe. Okay. One gray suit with pinstripe. Anything else? Well, I'd love to have a grand piano to practice my songs on. Okay. One grand piano. Are you sure you got lead in that pencil, Mr. Benny? <laughs> Yes, yes. Now, uh, what else do you want, Dennis? Well, I've always wanted one of those toy birds on a stick, and when you swing it around your head, the bird goes... Hmm. Okay. One bird on stick. Now, what else do you want? Oh, stop, will you? You're just trying to make Don and me jealous. Dennis isn't going to get all that stuff. Well, he's getting something he wants. Gee, I wonder what it is. I'll give you a hint, kid. <laughs> Spoil a surprise, for heaven's sake. Now, go ahead with your song, Dennis. Okay. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? I want to congratulate you on your performance as Mr. Hyde last week. I was so frightened, my hair stood on end. <laughs> uh, your hair... Uh, what hair? Right there. Stand up, Herman. <laughs> oh, get out of here. Hmm. Herman. Well, I suppose if you only got one hair, you might as well have a name for it. Sing, Dennis. Special announcement. The entire regular personnel of the sheriff's and police office has been placed on a two-platoon basis with 12-hour shift. All auxiliary personnel has been directed to stand by for emergency service instructions. The regular county defense program is functioning in an orderly manner, and citizens are urged to remain calm and avoid all unnecessary confusion because of hysteria. 
citizen volunteers are asked to go quietly to their nearest police or fire stations and offer their services if they wish to help. There is no immediate cause for alarm, and coolness will accomplish more than anything else. a medley of everything I love and all the things you are sung by Dennis Day. Very good, Dennis, but what's the idea of singing two songs today, huh? Well, Mr. Benny, I've got two girls, and I thought I'd dedicate a number to each of them. Two girls? Well, that's modern youth for you. You know, Dennis, when I was your age, uh, I was satisfied with only one girl. Gussie Bagelquist. Ah, uh, Gussie was a dream, yeah. Is that the girl you sued because she cut you with her buck teeth? <laughs> I never sued her. I just told her to get a brace on. <laughs> anyway, I was talking to Dennis. Whatever happened to your girl, Mr. Benny? Uh, Gussie? Oh, I went into vaudeville and she went away to veterinary college. And... <laughs> we sort of drifted apart. She's one of the biggest horse doctors in northern Illinois now. Uh, doing uh, very well, too. Do you keep in touch with her, Mr. Benny? Do you ever write to her? Oh, once in a while when he has a cold or something. Yeah, I had a touch of the flu a couple of weeks ago, and she sent me some pills that were as big as baseballs and some liniment to rub on my withers. <laughs> One thing about Gussie, though, I never get a bill from her. That's some... Well, hmm... Look who's here. Hiya, Jackson. How's my pal? Don't Jackson or pal me, Mr. Harris. Let me ask you something. Did you or did you not go into the Brown Derby after last Sunday's show and tell people that my acting was putrid? Last Sunday? Maybe I did. I say that lots of times. <laughs> well, you did. You told everybody at your table that I was very bad as Jekyll and Hyde. How do you know? Because I've got a waiter there that spies for me. Naturally, you couldn't tip a waiter just for waiting on you. Mary, that's a little arrangement between Andre and me. Yeah, I should have known that waiter was a spy. His mustache fell in my suit. <laughs> he wearing a false mustache? I told him not to overdo it. Anyway, Phil, you did run down my performance. Yeah, but I changed my mind about that. You know, I met one of the greatest dramatic actors in this town last night, and he said you were great. Orson thought you were terrific. Who, Orson Well? No, Orson Buggy. <laughs> Well, ma'am, that settles it. If I don't get Glenn Miller in my stocking Christmas morning, I'll never write another letter to Santa. And incidentally, Mr. Harris, you better have a good excuse for coming in late today. Well, I'm sorry, Jackson, but I was out shopping. Say, Mary, you know what I'm getting, Alice, for Christmas this year? No, what? A roaster. A roaster, say. You know, for the oven. <laughs> That's a roaster. Buys his wife a roaster for Christmas and calls it a roaster. All right, I'll put wheels on it. Hmm. <laughs> That's a sharpie, eh, Jackson? It's a toppy, eh, Jackson? Toppy, toppy, toppy. <laughs> and don't call me Jackson. I'm Mr. Benny to you and to everybody else on this program except Dennis. You mean I can call you Jack? Yes, until I make up with the others. <laughs> What burns me up, I worked my head off on that play last week and did a swell job. You sure did, Jack. And this little episode just shows me who my friends are. Stop telling them, Jack. <laughs> After all, I had to follow a pretty good actor in that part, Spencer Tracy. Why, I would never have even tried it if we both hadn't won the Academy Award. Wait a minute. When did you ever win the Academy Award? And another thing. I said, when did you ever win the Academy Award? Hmm. And another thing... Answer my question. When did you win the Academy Award? I wish I had, brother. Would I have you in a spot? <laughs> I guess that takes care of you. You said it, Jackie. 
Look, Dennis, just Jack, not Jackie. <laughs> And then she wants to take a whole foot. <laughs> what a gang. I got a good mind to go home. Oh, for goodness sake, Jack, will you stop acting like a baby? You ought to know the whole thing was a rib. Oh, sure. As a matter of fact, I liked your performance in Jekyll and Hyde so much that I wrote a sequel to it. Well, ain't you the fat little Noel Coward? <laughs> Who cares what you wrote? And Jack, Jack, now get this. As a favor to me, I want you to play the leading part in this drama. <laughs> I'll tell him when he comes in. You can keep your old sequel. But you've got to help me out, Jack. There's no one else in the cast with sufficient dramatic ability to handle it. Look, I'm not going to... Dramatic, eh? Well... Well... All right, Don, I'll do it. I thought you were mad at him. Never mind. You'd go over Niagara Falls in a Dixie cup if someone told you it was dramatic. <laughs> What's dramatic about a Dixie cup? Don, you say you've written a sequel to Jekyll and Hyde? Yes, Jack, but my play is called Mr. Hyde and Dr. Jekyll. Oh. Oh, well, that sounds interesting. Here's the script. Thanks. Just a second, Don. I'll give you a build-up. Chord, please. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Don Wilson, that eminent American author, has written another of his famous one-act plays. Take it, Don. The scene is the residence of Mr. and Mrs. Homer D. Hyde in the thriving little town of Upper Plate, Indiana. It is 7.30 p.m. Curtain. Music. Oh, dear, it's 7.30 and Homer isn't home yet. I wonder if his horse and buggy broke down. <laughs> Gee, I hope it's one of his moods. Ah, here he comes now. <laughs> Good evening, Homer, dear. You're a little late, aren't you? All right, I'm late. And I'll be late any time I feel like it. <laughs> aren't you going to kiss me, darling? Kiss me, kiss me. Every night a kiss. I'll kiss you with this umbrella. Ouch! <laughs> I'm going to bed. Good night. But, Homer, you haven't even said hello to the twins, Otto and Blotto. <laughs> Say hello to Daddy, children. Hello, Daddy. Hello, Daddy. <laughs> oh, shut up. <laughs> oh, shut up. One more peep out of you kids, and I'll kick your teeth out as soon as they grow in. <laughs> I'm going to bed now. But, Homer, darling, you haven't had your dinner yet. Dinner, dinner, every night dinner. I don't want any dinner. But, Homer, dear, at least have some dessert. What kind of dessert? I won't tell you, but I'm sure you like it. Here, have a dish. Very well. I'll try it. But if I eat it and decide I don't like it, someone will be dead. Murdered. Murder! <laughs> He's eating the dessert. I do hope he likes it. If not, what will happen to me and Otto and Blotto? <laughs> Gee. Oh, boy. <laughs> Oh, my darling, that tasted so good. What is the name of that tempting and economical dessert with a new locked-in process, hmm? <laughs> Jello, dear, and it comes in six delicious flavors. Strawberry, raspberry, jelly, orange, wena, and wine. <laughs> my sons, at last I love you. Congratulations, you wrote a wonderful play. But, Jack, without you, it would have been impossible. You were even better than the last week. Oh, I wouldn't say that. Well, how about a band number, Phil? Okay, Dowdy. <laughs> Hold it. Come in. 
Well, Mr. Benny, you did it again. Were you scared? Look at Herman. He just won't go down. <laughs> what a head he's got. That's the only persimmon I ever saw with brown eyes. Play, Phil. <laughs> Another war bulletin, Shanghai. The Japanese took over the American Shanghai Power and Light Company this morning. A bulletin from New York. The Japanese news agency broadcast tonight the Japanese foreign minister, Shinginori Togo, summoned U.S. Ambassador Joseph C. Grew and handed to him Japan's reply to Secretary of State Cordell Hull's terms for peace in the Pacific. This news came hours after the bombing of Honolulu. We return you now to Hollywood. Nango from Weekend in Havana, played by Blotto Harris, and that goes for the whole orchestra. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to announce that next week is a special attraction. Gee, Mr. Benny, I can't get over the way you played Mr. Hyde just now. Was that a performance? <laughs> it thrilled you, eh, Dennis? I'll say. That crazy laugh just sent shivers right through me. Well. The kid's right, Jackson. How'd you ever learn to do that? Well, Phil, you just have to get into a, the mood and feel it. You have to imagine that you're a raving maniac. When was the first time you ever did that crazy laugh, Jack? Last year at San Anita, lost three races in a row. <laughs> Never mind. When they caught him, he was chewing down the grandstand like a beaver. <laughs> well, you'd be mad, too. So let's forget it. Now, as I started to announce, ladies and gentlemen, next week is a special attraction. You know, Mr. Benny, I'd like to learn how to do that laugh so I can scare my girlfriend. Oh, it's easy, Dennis. Yeah, I wish you'd show me how to do it, Mr. Benny. Oh, I don't Come see. on, Jackson, do that laugh for us again. Well, look, Dennis, here's the way you do it. You've got to screw up your face and get it all distorted. Then you rip open your tie and shirt. Well, don't you have to muss up your hair a little? My hair? You know, those three Hermans. <laughs> That's not important. Anyway, Dennis, once you're in this mood, you read a menacing line and then laugh. Now, get this. I'm going out for a walk now. A nice, long walk. And when I come back, someone will be dead. Murdered. Murdered. <laughs> Ooh. What's the matter, Jack? My jaw. My jaw was out of place. His what? His jaw, his jaw slipped out of place. Get a doctor, get a doctor. Hurry up. What a performance. <laughs> Don't call my room and I didn't call my doctor. Dusty Bagelquist, Waukegan, 8362. Not her, just hold on the phone. Now take it easy, Jack, take it easy. Oh, it hurts. Just hold still, Jack, and I'll snap your jaw back in place. All right, hurry up, John. Now brace yourself. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Don. Dennis, the next time you want me to show you something, wait till the program's over. Well, it's your own fault for showing off. I wasn't showing off. Phil, well, I got a few left over from last week. <laughs> Put those fish back in the piano. <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, as I started to announce before I dislocated my jaw, next week as a special attraction... <laughs> The Benny Stock Company is going to present... Oh, now what? Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. What do you want? Boss, it's no use. I tried and tried and I can't get Carmichael to go to sleep. Rochester, that polar bear's got to go to sleep. He's supposed to have been in hibernation over ten days ago. Uh-huh. If Carmichael doesn't get to sleep by the middle of this month, he'll be a wreck in the spring. Where is he now? Sitting up in bed reading Esquire. <laughs> Esquire? 
Well, take it away from him. Oh, come now, boss. He's been around. <laughs> I mean, he's got to get to sleep. Now, Rochester, use a little, a little psychology on him. Give him some warm milk. Give him, give him some warm milk, put on his pajamas, and brush his teeth. Would you mind repeating that slowly, please? I said, give him some warm milk. Uh-huh. Put on his pajamas. Uh-huh. And brush his teeth. Uh-uh. Rochester, what are you afraid of? That bear is as gentle as a lamb. He wouldn't bite you. He wouldn't, eh? No. Then why am I the largest single user of Band-Aids in the USA? <laughs> Rochester, listen, Carmichael doesn't hate you. He likes you. He likes everybody. Then what happened to the gas man? <laughs> Nothing happened to the gas man. Carmichael doesn't eat people. You ought to see that letter he wrote Santa Claus. What letter? Dear Santa, please send a fat boy to read the meter. <laughs> oh, stop making things up. Now, you keep Carmichael in bed, and when I come home, I'll sing rock a baby to him. That'll put him to sleep. Okay, so long. So long. Oh, say, boss. Now what? Are you coming home for dinner tonight? Yes. Well, now finish up the wild up. <laughs> good, good. So long. I gotta get that bear to sleep before Christmas or he'll want a present. Play, Phil. Ooh, my jaw. <laughs> Friends, while you're looking through the December magazines in search of an idea for Aunt Martha's Christmas present, keep an eye open for this month's Jell-O page. A full page of Jell-O treats illustrated in such rich, glowing colors that it makes your mouth water just to look at it. One of the desserts is called Jack Benny's Special Apricot Ring, and honestly, friends, I think it's just about the grandest-looking dessert Jell-O ever made. It's an easy recipe, too. Just dissolve one package of lemon Jell-O in one and one-fourth cups of hot water. Next, add a dash of salt and three-fourths of a cup of syrup from the canned sliced apricots. Then chill until thickened and fold in two and a half cups of the sliced apricots themselves. When molded, Serve with a garnishing of whipped cream, apricot quarters, and green maraschino cherries. And there it is. A golden, glistening mold of juicy sliced apricots and sunny lemon jello. Canned apricots and lemon jello are being featured by many grocers all next week. So get them both and make up this delicious treat. Jello makes any gelatin recipe taste extra good because its locked in flavor gives you all the flavor always. <laughs> This is the last number of the 10th program in the current Jell-O series, and we will be with you again next Sunday night at the same time. Oh, Mary, you want to have dinner at my house tonight? No, thanks. I've had so much of that duck, I'm a bigger quack than Gussie. <laughs> Don't pay any attention to her, Gussie. Good night, folks. Phil! <laughs> Tomorrow, when you visit your grocers, look at the shelf where you always see those familiar packages of Jell-O. Right beside them, or very near them, you'll spy another Jell-O product. Jell-O puddings in three grand flavors. Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. You might try Jell-O butterscotch pudding. It's as smooth as cream and simply full of rich golden butterscotch flavor. A pudding that your whole family will want to enjoy again and again. So when you order Jell-O, order Jell-O puddings, too. They're just like Grandma's, only more so. This is the National Broadcasting Company.